All right, Joshua chapter 10. If you found that, why don't you stand? We'll read together God's Word. Joshua 10. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. By Joshua chapter 10, Israel is in the promised land. <clears throat> They've crossed the river. They've circled Jericho. The walls have fallen. They now have two defeats under their belt, Jericho and Ai. They've made a treaty with a people named the Gibeonites. Remember, they tricked them. The Gibeonites did. They traveled a long distance, or at least they looked like it. They really were neighbors, and they had crumbled bread and worn out sacks and shoes that were had holes in them. And Israel made a treaty with Gibeon. Now, the other kings in the cities in that area didn't like what was going on with the Gibeonites. Didn't like the Gibeon and made a treaty with Israel. So, in this story... All of those kings attack Gibeon. Gibeon hears it, knows that they're being attacked. They call Israel. Now Israel's got to come and make good on the promise they've made to Gibeon. Israel goes and this great battle ensues, one that God fights for his people. That's what we talk about today. God fighting for his people. And then we come to the famous passage, the sun standing Still, join me in that passage, verse 12. Let's just read the poetic retelling of the sun standing still. Let's start in verse 12. I'll read to verse 15. This is what the writer tells us. At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel, and he said in the sight of Israel, Sun stand still at Gibeon and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? The sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for, for about a whole day? There has, there has been no day like it before or since, when the Lord heeded the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. So Joshua returned, and all Israel with him, to the camp at Gilgal. Join me as we pray. <clears throat> Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, on the authority of your word, that you're speaking to the hearts of your people. There, there are men and women standing in this room that have had a most difficult week. That is behind us now, Lord. This is the first day of a new week, and we pray the Lord's day that you will speak and encourage and comfort and minister, Lord, and heal so that we might serve you. So, Lord, use this sermon and this passage for your people. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The longest Day. The Longest Day was a movie shot in 1962. It came out as a docudrama starring some really big names at the time. John Wayne was in it. Richard Burton was in it. Henry Fonda was in it. The Longest Day chronicled the 1944 invasion, the Allied invasion of Normandy, and the monumental battle that we know as D-Day. You reflect back on D-Day, it was the largest amphibious invasion in the history of warfare. Forever memorialized when you can YouTube Ronald Reagan's speech about the boys at Point Du Hoc. Longest day. For the thousands that gave their lives and for the thousands that lived through it and fought on into France, it was indeed the longest day. But as monumental as December the 7th was, as monumental as that day was, it pales in comparison to what God does for his people in this passage. The text before us is amazing any way you cut it. It, it even stretches the very bounds of credulity. As God listens to the voice of his servant Joshua 
and stop the earth rotating on its axis. Now, I read a lot of commentaries getting ready for this, and everybody's got an opinion on what happened, and a lot of people have tried to explain this away, that maybe it was an eclipse, maybe it was fog in the valley, maybe it was a cloudy day. They do everything they can to not say God actually stopped. But when you get a plain reading and you just look at it at face value, and this is what we do, what you have here is a day when God stopped the earth rotating on its axis, thereby giving us genuinely the longest day. Now, why that seems so hard for people to believe that are Christians, I do not know, because when you think about God and what He does, everything He does is a miracle. This is not the first time God has performed a miracle for Israel as they've gone into the promised land. The first miracle, when they crossed the river Jordan, God stopped the waters up and piled up on one side, dry on the other, they walked across. The second miracle was when they went into the town called Jericho, circled up the walls of Jericho, and the walls fell in. But this third miracle is different. The other two miracles were initiated by God. God told the people, go to the river, I'll stop the water, and you can get across. Go to the town Jericho, I'll make the walls fall down, and I'll give it to you. Those miracles were initiated by God. This miracle has a catch. This time, God is acting in response to one man's prayer. God listened to the voice of one person and fought for his people because of it. And brothers and sisters, what I want to do today, just for a few moments, <clears throat> what I want to do in the next few moments that we have together is to get your mind, we sang about it today, get your mind off lesser things for a little bit. And just for a little while, I want to talk about God. And I want to show you how our God fights for us. I, I, want, you, um, I want you, when you walk away today, I, I want you to walk away with your faith strengthened. I want your heart to be encouraged. I want your mind set on God. Now, there is a temptation. I have seen people fall to it. There is a temptation to misuse this passage, Son, stand still. There's a temptation to misuse this passage and make this passage about you, and if you'll pray hard enough, and if you'll believe long enough, and if you'll keep reaching, that God might do something just as miraculous as he did on that day. And it puts all of the, all of the weight and all of the freight and all of the effort on you. But this passage is not about you and me. This passage is about God. Adrian Rogers, the great preacher of another age, Adrian Rogers, um, I used to love to hear him preach. If you ever listen to Adrian Rogers preach, you, his voice was like no other. You listen to that guy preach, and if you're a Baptist preacher, it just makes you want to turn your Bible in because you know you'll never be as good as that. Adrian Rogers. He, Adrian Rogers says that, um, that there is no passage in the entire Old Testament that is more abused than this one. We don't want to abuse this passage. We don't want to stand over and abuse it. What we want to do is let's, let's stand under it and drink deep of the truth that's found here. This morning, I want you to see that our God, our God loves his people and fights their battles. In fact, I want to make it personal for you. If you are in Christ, our God loves you. If you're in Jesus, our God loves you and he fights your battles. So two things I want you to, well, really four things I want you to see. I want two absolutes and two promises. Two things that are absolutely true about God and then two promises that God will do. Here's the, here's the first absolute. Let's see if I can explain myself. Number one, God absolutely comforts his people. God absolutely comforts his people. You start in verse one, it goes to verse eight, and the punch of this is at the end in verses seven and eight. But to understand verse 7 and 8, you've got to understand the context starts in verse 1. So if you want to take your finger and just kind of skim along as I go, 
There in verse 1, we are told that the king of Jerusalem, his name is Adonai Zedek. You may know Melchizedek, which is the king of righteousness. Adonai Zedek, which is the Lord of righteousness. Melchizedek was a king at some point in Jerusalem before he became a Jewish city. This guy's a king there too. They don't like what's going on. He doesn't like it. And what he does is he heard how Joshua had captured Ai. He heard how he destroyed Ai, what he'd done to Jericho. And he heard how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made a treaty with the Israelites. And he feared greatly, verse 2 tells us. And so what he did was he got a coalition. Four other kings bound them up together so that there are five kingdoms and they're going to go against Gibeon. Remember that town? The, that group of people that made a treaty with Israel and tricked them, but Israel had to stand by it. And so these five kingdoms come together as allies and attack Gibeon is what verses 1 through 5 is about. And Gibeon in verse 6, let's just pick up in verse 6. The men of Gibeon sent to Joshua at the camp Gilgal saying, Do not relax your hand from your servants. Come up to us quickly. Save us and help us for all the kings of the Amorites who dwell in the hill country. They have gathered against us. So Israel has to make good on what they promised they would do. Verse 7. <clears throat> so Joshua went up from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and the mighty men of valor. Verse 8. And the Lord said to Joshua, slow down. Do not fear them. Look at the promise and the comfort. Do not. Over a thousand times in the Bible, God says to his people, don't be afraid. Some of the things that your soul needs to hear most is, hey, you, don't be afraid. This is not the first time that God has said this to Joshua. In fact, we're 10 chapters in. This is probably the fifth time. He says it for the very first time. Joshua chapter 1, verse 5 as they're going into Canaan and God says to Joshua and the people because he knows our hearts, don't be afraid. Look, this is the way God comforts his people. He doesn't comfort us by unveiling some new truth that we didn't know before. He doesn't comfort us by showing us something we'd not ever seen so we would be amazed you know what he does? He takes us back to some of those things that we already know. I received a uh, video. Somebody texted me a video yesterday afternoon. I, they were doing it to irritate me because they knew that the video would irritate me. And uh, it's a video of something going on in Nashville. It's called a Nashville outpouring. It's a, it's a gathering of some apostolic believers. Uh, and one of the videos is of a preacher standing up with a microphone and he says, I have a fresh and a new word from the Lord. And then he says uh, three or four sentences, not from the Bible. He's, three or four revelations had to do with the president and some angels in Africa. I don't know. It was bizarre. And then after saying it, says, thus says the Lord. Now, the truth is, we, that's garbage. We don't need that. We have been given Right there in your hands, in God's Word. We, we don't look for comfort in some sort of new revelation out there. We, we get comfort by the promises that God has already given in His Word. Each old promise, each old promise from God in the Bible, it takes on, some of you know this all too well, the promises of God in the Bible take on such great significance for your heart depending on what you're in the middle of. We don't, we don't need new truth. We need to take the old truth and freshly apply it to our hearts. I mean, this is why we do discipleship like we do. This is why we have a want on. It takes all these people to do a want on. This is why we approach student ministry like we do. This is why when a, when a preacher stands up, he's going to read the Bible and just talk about what does the Bible say. We, we believe, I mean, we opened up with the Lamentations, that God's mercies are new every morning. We certainly believe that God's mercies are new every morning, but God's promises are as old as God himself. And that brings us great 
great comfort. A lot of you had a really hard week. I understand that. I, I have them from time to time myself. Uh, Connie and I are friends with a, a young couple that lives in Mobile, Alabama, of our previous church, Dolphin Way. I say a young couple. You know, the idea of what a young couple is that gets older and older as you age. It used to be 20s and 30s. Now I'm thinking they're in the 50s. They're a young couple. This young couple uh, who have college-age students, the husband named Stephen, he uh, got COVID and got the, the strain of COVID that is so bad. It seems it pops up in these weird spots and he's a healthy young man and um, we, 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 we followed him along the way on social media and Connie talked to his wife, Daria, a good bit. And first it's pneumonia, then double pneumonia, and then he's in the hospital and then he's on a respirator. And then Thursday, the kind of gets the text, Stephen's with the Lord. And so that's when. What actually brings comfort? That's when you, you learn to say to someone like that, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. That's in the Bible. That a smoldering wick he will not put out and a bruised reed he will not break. That's in the Bible. That, that I, I pray that, the, that, that God would surround your, that the grace of God, the peace of God would surround your heart and mind in and, and Christ Jesus. It's, it's in the Bible. When we get pressed into those crevices and those corners and those times of pain, where do we go to get comforted? It's in God's Word. So I would just say to every grieving widow or widower, every worried parent, Every hurting mother, every frustrated believer, anxious brother, that our God absolutely comforts his people. That's the first absolute. Let me give you a second absolute. You'll find it down in verse 8. Here's number 2. <clears throat> number 2, God is absolutely sovereign. When I say sovereign, I mean God is absolutely in control of all things. Go back with me to, to verse 8 in chapter 10. Just read what it says. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not fear them. I have given them into your hands. Not a man will be able to stand against you. Now, you read verse 8. Who but God can actually talk like that? I have given. God speaks in the past tense about future happenings. God says what you look forward to in the future, you're worried about, I have already done it. Now be careful when you talk about divine sovereignty, God's sovereignty. Sometimes people will talk about sovereignty and put their life in neutral, like you don't have to do anything. Be careful when you talk about divine sovereignty. I mean, God being in absolute control that does not in any way negate our efforts. Does it negate our responsibility? In fact, God's sovereignty, what it does is it builds confidence. God's sovereignty encourages our responsibility. Let me show you where I get that. Verse 8 and 9, look at them together. Verse 8, here's what the Bible says. God says to Joshua and Israel, uh, I have given them into your hand. Now, verse 9. Joshua and the people of Israel don't go on vacation. Look what they do. Verse 9, join, join me there. So Joshua came upon them, that's the enemy, Joshua came upon them suddenly, having marched all night from Gilgal. Joshua and the people take on a forced march at night. I ran a 5K yesterday. I know a little bit about a forced march. <laughs> Took on a forced march, probably 20 miles, probably eight hours, nine hours in the dark to get to this people. It was a monumental effort in verse 9. They worked hard in verse 9 for the victory that's already given in verse 8. Verse 8, God's sovereignty, I have done it. Verse 9, God's people worked hard to do it. Let me see if I can explain it another way. 
We trust that uh, we are saved by God's grace, that salvation is fully and only an act of God. We don't bring anything to our salvation, the preacher says, except the sin that makes it necessary. We don't do anything. That is, God saves us at the cross of Jesus, the finished work of Jesus Christ at the cross. That is salvation, is what Jesus does. Sanctification, God sanctifies us, makes us holy, but you know how he does it? God does that through the growing disciplines, through the hard work, through knowing the Bible, spending time in prayer, sometimes fasting, fighting off temptation, working hard, the disciplines of growing in, in grace. Well, one, of the, one of the great comforting truths of the Bible, in my estimation, one of the great comforting truths of the Bible that we need to keep clinging to in the days ahead, I think in probably the next five or ten years, it's going to be really important for Christians to get this, is the absolute good sovereignty of a gracious God. Now look, this is really important for us. I think, uh, I think R.C. Sproul said it best. R.C. Sproul, he's dead now, but he led a ministry uh, called Legionnaire. I would just recommend that to you. Legionnaire Ministries, lots of good resources there. R.C. Sproul, he says that even if, if one molecule if one molecule in the universe is running loose outside of God's sovereignty, then there's no real reason for us to count on God's promises coming true. Uh, let me say it a shorter way. God's sovereignty is the track on which the train of our efforts run. This is why we, this is why we pray, pray for your children, this is why we endure. This is why we can stand under, uh, under hardness. This is why we trust and hope. This is why broken-hearted Christians, this is why Daria Wilson, I was just talking, this is why broken-hearted Christians will still be able to rejoice because God is good and God is absolutely sovereign. Two, two absolutes, two absolutes. I told you I'd give you two absolutes, and then I would, based on that, give two promises. Let's go to the first promise. Here's the third point and the first promise. Number three, and that is that God fights for his people. God fights for, I want to take you to the passage, it's verse 10 and 11. And when you read uh, that passage, it's the story of the battle that takes place. A poem will be written about it in verse 12 and following. That's what we read and we opened up. We'll get to that in a minute. But look in verse 10 how God is seen as a warrior. Some of that language we need to reintroduce to our understanding of how God works and who he is. I mean, you read the whole chapter. Chapter 10 is 45 verses long. You get past verse 15. Take, Israel takes those five kings ties them up, throws them in a, in a cave, put a rock over it, and goes, destroys the rest of the people in the land, just wipes them out at one point. They come back, get the king, put their, their, their boot on their necks, and they kill them, hang them on a truck. I mean, it's terrible. And, and just what? And there's this, this vengeance, this, this enemy of God being wiped out, God as a warrior. In fact, uh, let me just read it to you. In verse 11, he starts throwing hailstones. Verse 10 first, let's start there. And the Lord threw them into a panic before Israel, who struck with a great blow at Gibeon and chased them by the way of the ascent of Beth Haran, struck them as far as Azaka and Mekedah. So look at the verbs in verse 10. God threw, God struck, God chased. You get down to verse 11, and then you notice that these stones are falling from heaven. Look what verse 11 says. They fled before Israel while they were going down the ascent of Beth Haran. The Lord threw down large stones from heaven on them as far as Azekah, and they died, and there were more who died because of the hailstones than the sons of Israel killed who were killed by the sword. So you see what the editor tells us? That, that God starts, I thought it was just big rocks falling, but no, it's, it's hail. There's a giant hailstone. Imagine what Brad Panovich would do with this hailstorm. Now, all this hail is falling from the sky, giant rocks, killing people, 
And the writer says, now you need to understand, it's a battle that Israel was in, but God killed more of them than the Israelites did. It's a picture of, of God winning this. It's a brutal victory that God is winning for his people. This is a vision for God fighting for his... We need, um, we need to have the catechism. You remember the catechism we did a few years ago, the New City Catechism. Spurgeon had a Baptist catechism. Baptists don't want to do much with the catechism. But sometimes you'll find them in the Bible, and Psalm 24 is kind of a catechism. Verses 7 and 8, the psalmist says, Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift up ancient doors, so that the King of glory may come in. And the question, that's the catechism part, who is the king of glory? And the answer is he is the Lord. He is strong and mighty in battle. The battle. Honestly, some of you just need to, to remember, to be reminded, the battle is the Lord's. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Go there quickly. If you're a Christian, you know this story. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, when they came to arrest him, led by Judas, and Peter, in his anger, picked up a sword and cut off the ear of the Malchus, of the slave named Malchus. And Jesus healed that very quickly. And he looked at Peter and he said, Now, don't you know that if I wanted to, I could have 12 legions of angels here. The battle is mine. In Joshua chapter 10, God, this is what God has done. He has thrown the enemy into a panic. He destroyed them with giant hailstones. We, we are reminded of what the psalmist said in Psalm chapter 2 when he talks about the nations raging and our nations around the world raging. What does the psalmist say in verse 4 of that chapter? When the nations rage, he who sits on the throne, he laughs at them. This is our God. You know what this does? This helps me not to worry. This helps me when I think of that. I'm reminded to trust God. Look, you deal with a little, uh, a level of anxiety, and probably all of us got some of it right now. This should bring the temperature of that anxiety down. We trust in the sovereignty of God. You're, you're prone to panic. And there's plenty to panic about our day and time. It's good to, to focus your mind on the one who sits on the throne and laughs at that. You know what this does? This gives you endurance to walk through what you've got to walk through. And you, you can be reminded of, of this good God is fighting for you. I mean, you get to the very end of the chapter in verse 42, at the very end, the writer tells us that Joshua captured, captured all those kings and their land at one time, why? Because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. The battle is the Lord's. Let me give you one more promise, and that has to do with the sun standing still. Here's the fourth point and the second promise. Number four, simply that God hears his people. But let's finish by reading the, the poem. So the poem is verse 12 to verse 15. It is a retelling of the battle that's chronicled in verses 10 and 11. Let me read the account. Read the account and verse, notice verse 14, the editorial remarks in verse 14. Let's read. <clears throat> At that time, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord gave the Amorites over to the sons of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun stand still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stopped until the nation took vengeance on their enemies. Is this not written in the book of Jashar? That's a book that's no longer in existence, but it's mentioned in 1 Samuel and in the Kings. And the writer's saying, okay, this is, I'm not making this up. It's recorded somewhere else. Is this not mentioned in the, uh, written in the book of Jashar that the sun stopped in the midst of heaven and did not hurry to set for about a whole day? Listen to the, listen to the editorial remarks. There's never been, there has been no day like it before or since. What's amazing about it? The Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Keep looking at verse 14. 
the writer isn't amazed at the miracle. It's what God does, miracles. God performs, he, he does miracles. That's expected of God. He does these things that humans can't do. The writer is not amazed at the miracle. The writer is more focused and amazed that God listened to Joshua. That Joshua prayed and God listened. Now you see, right, that the power of prayer is the power of God. You hear some talk about prayer warriors, but the truth of the matter is, there are no prayer warriors. There's only one warrior, that is God. We go to him and ask him to fight. How do we pray? We pray, we pray in faith, we believe. And the value, by the way, the value of faith has less to do with the strength of your faith and more to do with what your faith is actually in. It's not the level of your intensity. It is what your faith is in. When we talk about salvation, we say when people are saved, they're saved by God's grace that is given to us at the cross. Jesus died on the cross in the place of sinners. God raised him from the dead, and it is a finished work. That is the save. Salvation happens at the cross, but that salvation, how do you appropriate it? How do you get to it? It's through faith. The power is not in the believing. The power is in the grace. We, we pray with, with faith. I think we pray, we pray with people. The text says in verse 12 that, that Joshua, in, the front of, in, in front of Israel, in the sight of Israel, they heard him say it when he spoke. He prayed so that they would hear. One of the great things you can do is not just lift your request to God, but let someone know that you are praying for them. Go even further. Let them actually hear or see you articulate that prayer. How encouraging it is to have people pray for me. How much more encouraging it is someone prays with me. Let me give you something else about prayer. Notice what he, he prays this outlandish. I would say you need to pray things that are clearly and directly beyond your ability. Asking God to do what is thought to be impossible. And verse 14 says, and the Lord heard his prayers. Brothers and sisters, I want you to see that, that our God loves his people. Or let me put it more personal. You in, are you in Jesus? Our God loves you. Fight your battles. This morning as we close together, I want to just end by asking a couple of questions in an attitude of prayer. So why don't you join me as we pray together? And uh, as you pray with me, just that, I'd like to lead by asking a couple of questions. So join me in a moment of prayer with your head bowed this morning. Let's go to the Lord as we pray. With your heads bowed where you are, let me just ask you this first question. What is your biggest battle you may have many things you're fighting think with me on the, the biggest what is that what is it you got it in your mind what is your biggest battle I'm calling you today to give that to the Lord where you're sitting you can whisper it and just say God this is yours the battle belongs to the Lord Here's a second question. What is it that is <clears throat> causing you the most heartache? All of us have things we deal with, but, but many of us have something that, is, that feels almost devastating. What is that? Get that in your mind. I want you to give that to the Lord. So just say it. Whisper, just give that to God right now. One more question. What is, what is the sin that keeps you from growing? It could be a temper, a mouth, could be an addiction, could, it, there are any number of things. What is it that has kept you from growing as a Christian? Right now, so just quietly give it to the Lord. 
This is what we believe, that God fought our worst battle at the cross of Jesus. There, Jesus takes the wrath of God away from every person that will believe. If you will put your faith in what Jesus has done, that he died on the cross in your place, God raised him from the dead, and if you will turn from your sin and believe, God will save you. Now, this morning we're going to sing, and as we do, I'm just going to invite any of you that any of you that just would like to come forward and symbolically place that a burden or a pain or a sin before the, that would help you just say, I'm giving this to God. Or maybe you'd like to talk to a pastor there on the front row or we'll be out in the lobby later, what it means to give your life to Jesus. The battle belongs to the Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your comfort. Thank you for Jesus that makes it so we can worship. And Lord, I pray you would strengthen your people. Give us hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.